looking at our agenda for today, uh, we're going to give a quick overview of uh, enhanced campaigns. We'll talk about some of the trends we're seeing in the market. Uh, Adam will share his perspective on um, what Walgreens is seeing and how they're thinking about multi-device marketing. We'll spend some time on what we've called the mobile opportunity gap and some best practices for holistic multi-device marketing strategy. And then finally, we'll give you some thoughts about where everything's going to help you uh, get ahead and prepare for uh, the future. And then, well, as Laura said, we'll take uh, some Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout, please go ahead and submit them in the chat box, and we will uh, hopefully get to as many as we can. So let's jump into an enhanced campaigns overview. Uh, if you're down with EC, then uh, you'll know the acronym because I'm going to save as many precious syllables as I can over the course of this webinar. So just the fact, ma'am, for those unfamiliar, Enhanced Campaigns, or EC, uh, is a new, uh, well, <laughs> was a new Google campaign type. Now it's probably old hand for um, most of us marketers that consolidated paid search management across desktop, tablet, and mobile ad placements. Google's official um, rationale for making the change was to make sure that holistic multi-device marketing became the default in this mad, mad mobile world. And today, of course, we celebrate the one-year birthday of Enhanced Campaigns. Uh, the official automatic migration to Enhanced Campaigns was one year ago today, although uh, the format itself first opened up uh, many months prior, and marketers had the opportunity um, to migrate. But uh, at this time last year, if you hadn't already moved over to Enhanced Campaigns, Google did it for you. So we will be uh, serving birthday cake and singing a little uh, happy birthday song to Enhanced Campaigns at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned for that. We'll have to bring in uh, Kelly Rather, our senior marketing content uh, manager, for that uh, rendition. All right, so we did a survey of uh, marketers that we just wrapped up, and we're going to be publishing those uh, the results in a paper, actually, uh, that's going live today. So I'll tell you where you can find that. And um, here's some of the key findings from this body of research uh, that was looking at enhanced campaigns one year later. First, we asked marketers what their initial attitude was towards the enhanced campaign migration. And 40%, uh, as you can see here, of respondents originally had a negative attitude uh, towards the EC migration. We'll talk about some of the reasons for that on this slide. Primarily, marketers were concerned about the impact it was going to have on campaign metrics by having desktop, tablet, and mobile phone all managed through uh, the same uh, campaign type. There was concern over increase in cost per click and unit economics that then would therefore um, potentially increase spend and click volume. And marketers were concerned, as you can see here, 51% were concerned that enhanced campaigns were going to have a decrease on their overall primary paid search key performance indicator. We'll talk about uh, what actually turned out to be the case, as many of um, the initial fears did not come to fruition. But uh, this just gives you a sense of where everyone's head was at a year ago when we were all freaking out about enhanced campaigns. In terms of the process that most marketers use to migrate to enhanced campaigns, about uh, three quarters of all marketers migrated a few campaigns at a time and monitored performance as opposed to uh, moving all their campaigns at once. And only 2% of marketers we surveyed actually waited until Google automatically migrated their campaign. So actually, most of you are celebrating your own enhanced campaigns birthday um, previously, before today. But 2% of you out there uh, waited until the absolute last minute, and uh, today was your day a year ago. Go ahead, Adam. You want to say yeah, I was going to say, we, we just add some color there. We actually had similar mindsets going into this, and I'll share some details in a, in a future slide here. And we also uh, followed the same uh, process of migrating a few campaigns early to gain some performance insights, and then migrated the rest uh, uh, before the date. Yeah, definitely a, a best practice. That, uh, we work with marketers on, take a few at a time so that there's no surprises from right. autom automatic migration date. All right, so we talked about some of the initial concerns that marketers had, how they were thinking about enhanced campaigns when they were first announced and rolled out. Now let's see what's actually happened out in the marketplace. Um, some recent data that we just released for the second quarter, you can see that overall on a global basis, uh, we, we saw a 25% year-over-year increase in paid search spend and an 8% year-over-year increase in cost per click. So indeed, uh, some of the um, rates across the board we have seen increases in, but uh, as you'll see, a lot of that has to do with how folks have been measuring and actually seeing value um, from all types of clicks. Uh, we didn't release the revenue uh, figures 
uh, here, but what I can tell you is that the increase in revenue that marketers saw as a result of their increase in spend was higher. So we're still seeing uh, increased profitability for the paid search channel. So with ad spend growing at a healthy 25% year-over-year rate and revenue growing even faster, it's still a good story for paid search in terms of effectiveness for the channel. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the um, cost per click increase has meant for marketers as we continue. And as far as the share of spending clicks for mobile goes, uh, it's probably no surprise to anybody active in the uh, search and digital marketing space. We're seeing increasing mobile activity with, cert with mobile now accounting for about 30% of spend uh, in the U.S. and higher in the U.K. and Australia. And as far as clicks goes, uh, anywhere between 30 and 45% of all clicks for all paid search clicks are now coming from mobile devices. As far as the cost per click rates, here you can see the absolute rates in Q2 by device. This is a, a global across um, a, uh, an index of Kenshu clients across all verticals and all regions. And you can see in U.S. dollars here, uh, desktop is still the highest cost per click at $0.65. Cents. Tablet is not far behind at $0.61. Cents, and phone is now at $0.55. Cents. And we'll talk about some of the ways that marketers are managing bids and using the mobile bid adjustments. Um, that are available to um, optimize bids. But certainly you can see the trend here over time. Uh, at this time last year, mobile phones was at $0.45 cent cost per click. Uh, so quite a bit of uh, increase on the phone, and we'll talk about why that is, but certainly part of that is due to the way that they're managed through enhanced campaigns, or as we now know them, campaigns. As far as performance, uh, here's another data point from our survey. When we asked marketers how the performance of mobile paid search compared to desktop. You'll see here the majority report that mobile performs slightly worse or much worse. Um, but then, of course, you also see that one in five say that mobile performs uh, slightly better. And so this, of course, is all relative. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, every marketer is going to have their own metrics, or should have if they don't already, uh, different metrics and objectives for mobile. And so um, it's important to not just hold mobile to the same accountability and same thresholds that you would your desktop programs. And um, that's going to uh, help you get a better handle on what is the true value of each mobile click and, of course, what should you, be, you should be spending to get that placement and um, that traffic. Anything you wanted to add here, Adam? Yeah, definitely. So that's exactly right. We, I would agree in that um, mobile is a different platform, right, but it has a different use case. And we'll talk a little bit in detail in a, in a future slide here about uh, not necessarily treating mobile differently in sense of um, a completely separate experience, but definitely treating it differently in terms of how it's being measured against the other experiences, whether it be desktop, laptop, tablet, etc. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Adam, why don't you go ahead and take it away and share more of Walgreens' perspective? Yeah, great, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, and as Aaron alluded to in, in some of the data, uh, we, we had some initial reactions that maybe weren't quite favorable. Um, specifically, we felt as though that this shift would go against all the best practices as laid out by Google directly. We had heard for months slash years that we should take the time to build our campaigns to the most granular level to target devices by carrier uh, with specific messages to the device. So iPhone on AT&T might see a different uh, message versus you know iPhone on Verizon or what have you, and and we had actually taken the time to to build those campaigns out to that to that level of, of granularity, uh, it, which is a, a segue into the next bu a bubble there, which you can see it's a, we felt that this removed a lot of the control that we had uh, to to make these campaigns really efficient at that most granular level. So we were feeling as though this shift was going against best practices, uh, removed the control. We got the concept of it being, uh, you know, kind of uh, forcing people to think mobile first, and we agreed. Uh, mobile is and, and always will be a very important part of our, our strategy and our roadmap, but the shift in timing didn't allow, align with our internal business needs and timing. So while we were working on shifting towards a mobile first mindset, the July 22nd date seemed a little arbitrary, and, and we were a, a, a little taken aback by that. Um, so our initial reactions weren't, weren't the most favorable. Um, but we did, we did, of course, approach it with, uh, with the utmost of care. So what were our major findings as we were um, shifting gears? Um, 
as I mentioned before, we did lose control over device and OS targeting. Not a big deal, but we did, for some of our business units, have specific messages for the device and, and the carrier even. Uh, so for example, for our photo business, we have our three business units to be sure. We have our pharmacy business, which is all the prescriptions, our photo business, which as you can imagine, are prints and calendars and so on, and then our daily living business, which are all the sundries, the front of store items, the, the mops, the shampoos, the band-aids, the chips. Those three separate business units each have a slightly different use case. And for photo, since mostly the experience is flash-based when you're uploading your pictures and designing your calendar, we had very specific messaging, helping the customer get through the experience maybe starting the process on phone and then shifting back to desktop. And we would use search ads to, to help them along with that, to have this kind of sequenced ad approach. And so we lost a lot of that messaging capability with, with the shift to enhanced campaigns to EC. Not a big deal, but something we had to adjust for. It also um, created a scenario whereby we had to have, in an ideal world, a single URL for uh, all of the experiences. And, and this is a bit of a challenge for us because of our different backend systems. Some of you on, on the phone may not have had this challenge, but uh, for us, we had various platforms that each of the business units posted on, and therefore caused uh, some, some challenges when picking up a URL that had to be chosen as the best URL for that experience. When we um, did enable mobile, we did see a drop in conversion rate, and that was mainly due to, um, again, the experiences, and I use photo as an example where the flash experience isn't necessarily designed for the iOS devices. Um, so going to the comment earlier, or speaking to the comment earlier about having a device-specific goal in mind, uh, we were okay in some ways with the conversion rate drop, with this kind of new uh, model. Uh, we adjusted for it, of course, and, and I'll speak to that in a moment, the next line there. But um, we did have very clear kind of goals for each business unit, pharmacy, photo, and data living, and for each device type, whether it was desktop, tablet, or mobile. Uh, so we did see a drop, but we, we were planning for that, and, and we adjusted for it. And really the way we adjusted for it, that line there, is by using bid adjustments. Um, we, we made full use of all of the multipliers that are available, uh, you know, setting them up or down to really kind of drive the traffic where we wanted the traffic to go. So for photo, we definitely dialed the adjustments down to, to try to limit the exposure there uh, until we work on the back-end processes to, to clean up the flash and so on. So those are the major findings uh, across the, the kind of the businesses um, summarized in a few, few bullets there. So what is our current operating mode? In short, basically all of our brand keywords, and specifically brand plus in our world is Walgreens plus some some other keyword are opted into mobile in a very controlled way using the multipliers again, the bit adjustments. We do control those, but more or less all brand keywords are are opted into mobile. And when I say opted in, I mean don't have a, a negative 100% uh, multiplier uh, and so on. Uh, but not all lines of businesses are opted in. As I mentioned, photo, we're approaching very cautiously uh, because of the experience or the customer experience there. But daily living, we have pockets of daily living that are opted in based again on the use case. So our beauty business is different than vitamins and so on. So we, we select it by department. Uh, and we have definitely accelerated the mobile first thinking. That was something internally that we were accelerating. Uh, we did not accelerate it in response to the enhanced campaigns. It's just uh, given our own data where our customers are going, given the marketplace changing. Uh, we, we did accelerate the, the roadmap for our, our, our redesign uh, for adaptive and responsive, et cetera, uh, removing the flash as much as possible. And I think Google just announced that uh, even some of the flash sites are going to start to be slightly um, delisted in some of the SEO results even, so Google's definitely uh, reacting to the flash. And we've, we've actually along the way gained deeper insight into the device usage by business unit and by customer. So uh, we've got a, a lot of great, uh, great takeaways. And so the last slide here uh, for my section is the key takeaways, right? Device, non-desktop devices are primary players. We all kind of knew this. Um, and it's really not even the laptop anymore. The laptop sales are, are declining. It's really truly the mobile and the tablet devices. Um, Google, of course, was ahead of the curve in seeing the trends, um, but you know, if you haven't already, please definitely watch the trends, accelerate your, your thinking, which is number two here. Prioritize the adaptive responsive design. If it's in your roadmap, move it up. If it's not in your roadmap, um, put it in your roadmap. It's, it's going to be key. And of course, test, test, and retest. If you haven't tested adjusting your multiplier, your designs, your use cases for the device, 
uh, test, test, and test, test. It's a very dynamic world that we live in, and so uh, never rest on your laurels. Always be testing. ABT. Thanks, Adam. All right, let's talk a little bit about what we're calling the mobile opportunity gap. I'm going to share now some research that Ken Shu conducted with Yahoo and was published recently in a report called Advertiser Perceptions of the Three Screen World. And again, at the end of the webinar, I'll share all the URLs where you can download uh, this research. So no surprise here when we ask marketers if the interplay between paid search across devices makes an impact on consumer activity. Almost everybody uh, said that it has some impact. Um, yet when it comes to the sophistication of cross-device marketing strategy, many folks are either uh, only somewhat aligned with consumer trends or very behind. So this is what we're referring to as the gap. Clearly consumers are using mobile more and more as part of their everyday content consumption, purchase behavior, um, but yet marketers still have some work to do in terms of adopting their marketing strategies. So specifically, what are some of the areas that marketers are focused on? We're about half-half uh, in terms of folks that are providing um, a rich, optimized phone or tablet experience for visitors, and the other half is either planning on doing it this year or planning on exploring it this year. And then we've got a small sliver that's not planning on exploring it or doing it at all. Of course, room to grow here. And in terms of specific mobile functionality that marketers are currently using with their ads, here we asked uh, if folks were using things like click to call, location extensions, mobile product listing ads. And we found that about 50% are using click to call or location extensions. Uh, and just over one in five are using mobile PLAs with the full 30% using none of, the, uh, none of these options. So these are certainly features that are going to help with um, specific mobile conversion types and other uh, f uh, forms of interaction that are going to be preferred to your consumers, your customers that are searching for you and reaching you over the mobile device. So um, it certainly behooves you to take advantage of some of these, especially if you're in the retail space. And as far as um, optimizing bids, Adam talked a little bit about mobile bid adjustments. And so we asked folks how difficult it was to manage these MBAs. And what we found was about 50% reporting that it's, t it's difficult to do these manually. And so it's uh, incumbent upon marketers to use advanced algorithms or third-party tools that can help automatically make those mobile bid adjustments based on your goals and helping you achieve them through all devices. And furthermore, the bids are just one component of how you can impact your overall search performance. Having mobile-specific ad copy is best practice, using mobile extensions, and of course we spend a lot of time talking about the mobile optimized experience. And here you can see almost half of marketers surveyed reported that mobile optimized landing pages have the biggest impact on overall performance. So if this is not part of your current practice, make it so. Let's get into a few more best practices for multi-device marketing. The first, we've talked about this quite a bit, is to establish concrete device-specific goals. It's, you don't want to think about um, phone and tablet performance in the same way that you're measuring desktop. Um, and here are some of the different types of goals that marketers are setting for mobile paid search. Things like online traffic, a full third are focused on. Uh, we've got 4% who use mobile to drive traffic in-store. They have a brick and mortar location. Another full third are looking to drive direct sales from mobile paid search. 10% are looking to drive phone calls, and 20% have um, some other conversion activity that's their primary paid search goal. So, of course, this is something that's going to be different for every business and, or, and type of organization, but it's really important to think about how you're setting your goals and benchmarks for mobile separately, and then, of course, you can optimize accordingly. The second best practice is to align your messaging across channels. And here we have um, some, some research that was recently conducted by Kenshu that shows that when you are, are leveraging social media, you can improve your paid search performance. In this case here, we saw a 30% lift in return on ad spend for um, uh, campaigns that, for paid search campaigns that were running in conjunction with paid social campaigns. We saw a bump in average order value, a higher click-through rate, and a lower CPA when marketers were running paid social in conjunction with paid search. So I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that are, uh, would love to get better performance from paid search and are doing everything that, that you can within the channel. Some of the best practices we've laid out so far, 
mobile bid adjustments, thinking about creative landing page experiences, et cetera, um, to try and maximize performance from paid search. This is saying here that uh, one way to get better performance from your paid search is to run social advertising at the same time. And you can see the leak over effect as you generate interest and interaction through social that manifests itself through search. We went one step deeper in this research, and this is our most recent study of the cross-channel synergy here. And what we found in this case, this was for a financial uh, services advertiser, we found that there's sort of a sweet spot in terms of just how much you need to spend in social advertising to have that crossover impact on paid search. So we set up four test groups, uh, one that, that had no Facebook ad spend, one that had a low Facebook ad spend, one that had a medium level of Facebook ad spend, which was de defined as 1.8x higher than the low, and one with a high uh, amount of Facebook ad spend, and that was 2.34 times higher than the low. And what we found was somewhere in between uh, the medium and the high is where a sweet spot emerges for conversion rate and conversion volume. And we found that when you had Facebook ads running at the same time as paid search, the paid search conversion volume went up uh, 27% for conversion volume and 14% for conversion rate when you had a high level of Facebook spend. When you had a medium level of Facebook spend, we found a 24% increase in conversion volume and a 15% increase in conversion rate. So this kind of sets the, the, uh, the, the floor and the ceiling for how much to invest in Facebook to get the leak over and latent effect on paid search. It's going to be different for every uh, marketer, of course. These numbers won't necessarily apply to your business, but I'm sure every business is going to have some threshold, and it's incumbent upon you to try and identify that and figure out what is your sweet spot. Uh, there's a minimum that you need to spend to generate that extra interest, and then a point of diminishing returns, after which it may or may not be worth it for you to continue to spend. And of course, both of these studies are just showing the impact of Facebook advertising on um, search and, and the incremental lift in search activity. It's also worth stating that both of these uh, studies show that just measuring the success of Facebook within its own channel was deemed successful. So Facebook advertising is a great way to generate direct response and ROI results um, just within its own channel. But then, of course, when you add in the impact it has on search, the results get even better. Third best practice is to leverage advanced tech targeting techniques. So think about uh, targeting by location, by device, by time of day as a way to reach and engage your most valuable audiences and deploy, deploy device-specific bidding strategies. So we've talked a lot about MBAs, mobile bid adjustments. In our survey, we asked marketers how they were using MBAs, and about uh, a quarter of them are using MBAs to increase their mobile bids, so trying to bid up for mobile, and that likely has to do with marketers that are set goals um, against mobile clicks and conversions separately than desktops, certainly anyone in the gaming space. Um, if you're trying to drive uh, app downloads or engagement, mobile is going to be your primary uh, performance channel. And then here, of course, you can also see 60% are using it to decrease mobile bids, and 10% are opting out completely by setting a negative 100% MBA. In terms of post-click experience, uh, we've talked about this and we'll continue to harp on it, but uh, it's really important to optimize that customer experience across devices. As you can see here, this is from some of the research we did with Yahoo. Um, a full 50% of consumers are disappointed when companies don't have an optimized site on tablet and 44% on mobile. And you can see the impact it has. They're less likely to revisit your site if it's not optimized that first time. So it's a lot of uh, quick, um, quick decisions being made when consumers arrive at a site. If it's not optimized that first time, then you've likely lost them. Anything you want to add here, Adam? Yeah, I would, I would agree um, in that. It's, it, the customer is making a, a quick decision about their first experience. It, it's really hard to draw them back uh, once you've lost them that first time. It, I would add, though, and I know I've said this a few times, it is based on use case. So our pharmacy experience, right, is, is different and it's designed for mobile. So we've purposely designed that for a mobile experience. Conversely, though, some of the data living, uh, you know, experiences, some of the departments, it's not to say that mobile is not important, but we do know that there's a strong store component. There's an in-store piece, so we've designed the experience slightly different. So it, it, I think adding to everything that we've just said and, and to this slide here, it really depends on the use case and, like you said, on your business and what you're looking to, to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And then finally, the six best practices to implement multi-touch attribution models. Uh, we talked a little bit about the cross-channel effect between um, search and social. Of course, every channel, every touch point with your consumer is going to have an impact, so it's important to weight those interactions based on the true value and then bid, set your bids based on what that value is. So we published some research that looked at Facebook specifically, and what we found was that when you, uh, marketers moved away from the last click default attribution model, Facebook got um, uh, incremental lift in terms of its credit and impact on the program, all the way up to 30% higher um, uh, attribution when moving away from, from the last click. So really important to deploy a multi-touch model and give the weight based on each interaction. So let's look ahead into our crystal ball a little bit of uh, the future of multi-device marketing. And I think the first imperative here is to broaden your definition of mobile and devices. Today we're thinking about phones and tablets, but there's many other devices that are um, emerging and becoming increasingly popular that um, we're going to need to be thinking about as, as brands, as marketers in the, in the near and long-term future. Things like wearable technology, um, things like, uh, so whether that's Google Glass, uh, whether it's smart watches, in the health category, you've got um, the Fitbits, the fuel bands, there's home automation, so Google, of course, uh, is now, um, now owns Nest, and uh, they also bought Dropcam, so other ways of uh, devices that automate pieces of uh, your home living, the rumored Apple TV that we've all been waiting for, forever, not the Apple TV that, you know, helps you just sling some music, um, but the gorgeous big glass flat screen or curved screen or whatever the latest uh, rumors are that we've all been waiting for. Uh, that's another device to, to be thinking about and how that's going to impact your marketing strategy. And of course, all the car integration, um, whether that's Siri or Google Voice Search that's getting embedded in the uh, endemic nav systems that are being put into uh, new cars as they come off um, the assembly line. All of these are new ways of reaching consumers beyond the desktop, beyond the phone, and beyond the tablet. So it's really important to think about from a brand perspective um, how your consumers are using these types of devices and what opportunities um, will become available to you to help make sure that your brand is part of the considered set if and when these platforms open themselves up. And uh, based on you know everything that we've seen, from Google and companies like it, we can bet that there will be some opportunities for brands to insert themselves into the process here. Yeah, and I think Google has more or less said that they will allow for ads on Nest at some point in the future. They haven't declined it, but they haven't confirmed it either. I think the takeaway, though, here is uh, is not to suggest that we should have ads on everything and everywhere, right? But it is to to think of those scenarios whereby uh, an ad or a message. We talk about ads, which could be a message. Uh, that is appropriate for that context, right? So making this up, and I would have to put some thought into it, but the idea could be if the Nest system senses some temperature rises and so on, it could show some information around sunscreen or something like that, right? So if you're going out in the sun, you know, be careful. I'm not suggesting, nor is, is Walgreens suggesting that we're going to have ads everywhere, but I think it's about presenting the right message to the right person at the right time in the right context, and whether that device is on your face with Google Glass, whether it's in your car with the, you know, the integration with Siri in the automotive space, I think it's just thinking about the context of the message. Yeah, and certainly as this automation pervades all these other uh, formats, from a search marketing perspective, we need to think about the fact that each time one of these devices is deployed, it potentially is eliminating mm -hmm. search queries along the way, right? It used to be, you know, if uh, you were walking around and you wanted to look something up, you would pull out your phone and type in a query. Now you can just, you know, say, OK, Glass, and, and Google it. Um, in other situations, if you were, you know, wanting to um, monitor your health, whether it be your exercise or your nutrition, right? think of all the search queries that you would perform in the act of doing that. Now all that's automated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so more and more, especially also you know, in your car, a lot of us are out there being unsafe and, uh, and binging things while we're driving. Um, now that you, with, um, with these types of solutions built into the car, voice search comes into play. And so what we've known is that, that query that gets typed into a search bar upon which we deploy all our ads against, a lot of those uh, searches are going to be eliminated in this new world order. So it's important to think about 
how um, we can insert our brands without necessarily waiting for individual search queries along the way. Another best practice is certainly to keep an eye on Google and other things that they have coming. Um, for retailers out there, hopefully you're familiar with shopping campaigns, which is a new campaign type for managing product listing ads. And uh, next month, um, there'll be um, an automatic migration to this new format for shopping campaigns, which will feature streamlined product-based bidding, some advanced reporting tools, as well as uh, some new competitive landscape data. So be sure to keep an eye on that. And think about uh, leveraging mobile app downloads as an ad format. Um, so if you have an app and you're trying to generate usage, and uh, it's really important to, one, leverage the ad formats that can help drive that, but two, make sure that you're measuring the full cycle of the usage of that app and getting to a true customer lifetime value metric. So beyond installs, um, tracking any in-app activity, if there's any revenue generated within the app, uh, can't you as an SDK that you can deploy that helps you measure all that activity and then attribute it back to the ad that actually drove that initial install. So it's a great way to know the true value of each of these ads and manage your budget to it. And we spent a, a lot of time um, talking about Google, but let's not forget about Bing and Yahoo as well. Both of these companies are innovating rapidly within the um, search space, within the mobile space. Uh, Bing, of course, has um, recently unveiled its product ads. Yahoo has its native ad format uh, called Stream Ads. <coughs> There's a number of um, opportunities from a mobile marketing perspective that you want to make sure to, to capitalize on. So I've referenced a good deal of uh, research from our Enhanced Campaigns One Year Later report, and that is now available at kenshu.com slash EC. So if you want to get all the insights, we have the survey data, and we also have individual marketer perspectives from brands and agencies around the world. So be sure to download that. and. Um, uh, perhaps join me in wishing Enhanced Campaigns a happy birthday. I promise singing. I don't see Kelly, but maybe I'll do it for her. So I'm going to sing Happy Birthday to Enhanced Campaigns. You didn't think I would. Well, Laura knew I would. But uh, I'm going to do that just to buy you all some time to submit your questions into the chat box. We've reached the end of the content here. So um, uh, submit your questions, and we'll compile them, and Adam and I will answer them in a minute. And I'd like to introduce you thankfully was listening from the next room. So Kelly Rather is going to join me in singing Happy Birthday to Enhanced Campaigns. A one, a two, a three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Kelly, for never leaving me hanging. And did we get any questions? Okay, we've got a couple. All right. Um, so while we take your Q&A, I'm just going to put up here our last slide, which shows the URLs for all the research that was referenced in today's uh, presentation. So again, go ahead and submit your questions. Laura, what's the first one we got? Um, well, the first question is, can you share anything more about your mobile roadmap or strategy? And Adam, I think that's directed to you. Yep. Um, I'll share what I can. I can't share a lot of specifics because some of it's proprietary, of course. But uh, I can tell you it is a key piece and a centerpiece of our overall strategy. Um, we know that we live either anecdotally or as consumers in an ever-increasing mobile world. Um, so, you know, working to making sure the Digital experience, the mobile experience, uh, enhances the store experience is key, right? As we know that a lot of people showroom, and now there's research that people are it's boomer rooming, I think is what they're calling it, where they will research online, go in store, and then go back to the online space to actually complete. Uh, so it, it, the, the takeaway is, um, and this is probably no surprise to anybody listening here, you guys are all experiencing this, mobile is a key piece of our, our overall strategy. It's a centerpiece. We're doing everything we can to um, to make sure that all the experiences across devices are are set up for success for that customer, right? Whether it be adaptive, responsive, what have you, including all of our marketing, uh, so email templates and so on and so forth, using dynamic URLs in paid search to make sure that we're bringing people to the right point in the experience, uh, whether it's on the mobile device and bringing them into the app and what have you. So. 
mobile first is kind of the takeaway, and you guys have probably experienced this either, like I said, as a consumer anecdotally or in your, your workplace. Uh, beyond that, I can't share too many specifics, unfortunately, but uh, it's, it's something that's very top of mind for us right now. Okay, great. Um, and as for a follow-up question, outside of search, where are you seeing success? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say search is one of those channels that you can never stop optimizing, right? There's always going to be something more that you can optimize, uh, whether it's using negatives, whether, you know, expanding your negative list, whether it's modifying the, 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 the bid adjustments and what have you, um, broad match modifiers, all kinds of things. And I'm sure Google will continue to keep that space very dynamic. I do like the one slide that Aaron had up a moment ago talking about expanding into social. I think that is, is kind of key. And the takeaway is, right, and we all kind of know this, integrated marketing works. So if you think you've optimized search to the nth degree, which I can almost assure you you probably haven't, uh, you know, look to those other channels that can enhance and complement the what you're doing in the search space. So like Facebook and using platforms, you know, uh, like Kenshu to, to expand into those other areas, whether it be, you know, social or what have you. But I think I think the social integration is very key. We know there's a strong correlation between what people are doing on Facebook or any of the social platforms with what they're searching for. Um, so using that data to, and, and that, that information to complement each, each channel, I think is, is very key. Yeah, that's a great point. We're definitely seeing um, a lot of folks taking insights from one channel and applying to another. And I think Walgreens is, is uh, at the front end of, of leveraging that. And from a Kenship perspective, we're trying, to build, we're trying to automate as much of that as, as we can. So whether it's taking um, a feed, a product feed for retail, or product listing ads, or uh, you know, in the case of um, travel or, or other verticals, um, taking the best performing ads from um, search and feeding them to social is another way to extend your search performance, right? Because if you know what people are searching for and you know what, what um, ads are working best in terms of a conversion or whatever your metric is, cherry picking those and bringing them over to a Facebook can be a great way to complement your strategy. At the same time, too, even from an audience targeting perspective, um, being able to just uh, build custom audiences on Facebook based on what you know people were searching for can be a highly uh, effective tactic. And we talked about the multi-touch attribution, which then helps you give credit to um, each ad along the consumer journey. All of those things working in concert, uh, it's going to help you get the most bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Laura? I think that's it, but if anyone has anything last minute, feel free to enter it in the chat box and we can get to it right now. Should we sing again? <laughs> Happy one year and one hour for Street and Half campaigns. Well, I think we can probably wrap it here. Uh, we're going to make this um, webinar, both the slides and the recording, available on our website. Um, so we'll be sure to email that out to everyone who attended. I'd like to thank Adam Garcia yeah. uh, from uh, Walgreens for sharing his insights with us today. We really appreciate uh, your time and, uh, and your energy, and I think that um, we can all take something away from, uh, from this to apply to each of our businesses. So with that, I will thank you all for joining us here today, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Kenshu webinar.